Ready to begin? Hello, uh, welcome to Slug. Um, if anybody wants a, a talk, on, if anybody's interested in an idea for what a talk is, uh, if you want to offer a talk or you would like to see a talk, maybe you could just write it down and maybe someone will uh, offer to do a talk for next month. Uh, we usually end up chasing talks at the when it comes a, a week ahead of the uh, the meeting, and I'd like to try to get a talk arranged for the next month's meeting before, uh, so we don't have to chase people. Um, I'm Robert, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, Docker. Now, Docker is last two weeks ago now. Uh, they released their 1.0 release. So now it's officially, according to them, production ready. Uh, Red Hat 7 came out pretty much the same week with Docker 1.0 as part of its main features. Uh, I think they were pretty much, obviously, Red Hat was waiting for Docker 1.0. Um, the book on Docker is going to be released next month, and it's had its first exploit. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, someone found out a way to get out of a Docker container. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds because it was on the pre-production ready release. Uh, the, the production ready release does not have this fault, and they changed the way they do. They changed from being a blacklist of what things they wanted to block to being a whitelist for what things they want to allow. So it's not going to happen in future releases, hopefully. Um, the feature le release of the current uh, is, it basically works on layered storage devices, uh, layered store file system levels. So you start off with your, with your base layer, uh, and on top of that you put any changes you do to the file system, and then, so it's like a version control system. You start off with your base layer, and any changes you do uh, is recorded into the next layer, and when you commit that, any changes you do is recorded into the layer after that, etc. So it's like a stacked type arrangement. Um, they have a repository, uh, so you can push your uh, Docker images into the cloud and pull them down again. Uh, you can also run your own registry if you want to. Um, it's based on established container technology. Uh, Linux has had various forms of containers uh, for a while now. All Docker is is a way of standardizing that and packaging it into a, into a known entity. Uh, you can do everything that Docker does uh, with basic standard Linux commands. Without Docker, it's just a lot more tedious and probably less reliable because you're going to do something different from last time. Uh, it's much lighter weighted than VMs. Uh, you could get, it takes like less than a second to start a Docker image. Uh, and you can run hundreds of them in, this, in the, about the same amount of resources that a, a normal VM has. And of course, it's modular and dynamic. So, with the 1.0 release, they now have official ports for connecting to the API to control your uh, Docker instances. You also, with 1.0, they now have a pause and unpause, so you can pause your container and every all the processes in it. Uh, and they moved from a security blacklist to a security whitelist. Uh, they also fix a lot of bugs, and of course, it's production ready now, officially. Apparently, a lot of people have been using it in production already. Uh, the developers have always said, don't do this, but people don't listen. Uh, so what is it used for? Um, so you can use it for a number of different areas. You have cloud deployments. There are people who are using it as a virtual private service. Uh, this is where .cloud originally came from. They're the ones that started. They had this in their cloud system, and they decided to clean it up and release it to the public. And they since renamed their company after Docker to become the Docker company. Uh, you can use it in development. Uh, so in development, You've got no one builds, you know one set up, you know what uh, you're testing on. You don't have to worry about have I set my is my test set up exactly the same as my neighbor's test set up, etc. Uh, and of course, there's already people integrating into test setups for 
integrated testing uh, deployment is a good use case because uh, it's cross distro. So if you if you write something to run inside a Docker container, it'll run on pretty much any distro out there, uh, anything with a reasonably modern kernel, uh, and you've got version controlled updates. So if I'm running my uh, Docker image of version one, I know it's version one, and I can tag it as being version one, and when I can pull down the latest one, and I can decide which one I want to run, etc. Uh, you also have some security implications, uh, given that only inside the Docker container, you only have your uh, application processes. You don't have a whole operating system. That gives you less of an attack service. You don't have other processes running, other ports potentially open, etc. cetera. Uh, but it is not a complete isolation, as that uh, exploit demonstrated. They're not advertising it as an isolation, security isolation, at least not at this stage. So for cloud deployment. So in the cloud, like I said before, you can deploy it as a whole OS, like a VPS type arrangement. Uh, it's API, it has API interfaces, so you could have a web interface to control the deployment of it and which ones are running where and who has access and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's dynamic, so APIs could be scripted to move the containers around. Uh, there's even a distro that specializes in just doing cloud for uh, Docker images called Core OS, and it has several uh, interactive pieces such as uh, you can have, they share a common ETC. So instead of having an ETC directory, they have uh, what they call an ETC daemon, and that's an all your settings are then distributed across all your Core OS instances and your Docker instance can read those settings and run accordingly. So for development, um, one of the big advantages here is that you've got a known environment uh, that's ideally the same as production. You, you can develop in your Docker in instance, and when you've developed it, tested it, you can use the exact same Docker instance in production and you know that it's been tested. You know that nothing else has changed. Everything is self-contained in the container, so it, you know it's got all the same install, setup, everything. And version tracked, so you can have uh, your, your, your application version one that's in production, and you can be developing your application version two and tag it such and keep them set separate, but then when you're ready, you can tag it as being this is now my latest, and then next time the production starts, it'll get the latest and, and run that. Uh, it even has Git hookups. So one of the services that the .cloud people offer is that they have a in their Docker uh, registry, you can actually tie it into your Git repository such that when a commit is done to your Git repository, it will automatically use that, that uh, that instance of Git, that uh, version of Git, to pull down and build a new instance of Docker. Uh, you also have uh, the main, usually most people use a Docker file to build Docker instances, and basically it's just a, I suppose you could call it a specialized script language for building Docker instances. People have also done builds with Vagrant. Vagrant understands Docker these days as well, so you can do that sort of thing as well. And there's a boot to Docker uh, Vagrant image, which is basically a virtual box, um, uh, virtual machine that has Docker built into it. And basically for people who want to run a Docker instance on their Windows or Mac machine. So then you've got the uh, development and testing type of area. So in developments, you can have your test scripts controlled via API, so as you could link it into Jira or something like that to uh, automatically, sorry, Jenkins, to automatically um, build 
and run tests on your Docker images. Uh, you can link multiple containers together within your same machine. So often if you're developing a whole cloud type infrastructure, you can't have multiple machines running on your one machine, even with virtualization. It becomes a little bit hard to run a dozen virtual machines on the one laptop. But uh, with Docker, that's not a problem. And you can control how they're linked together and link them together in the way that you want. Uh, from a known base, they are quick to build. So what you would, like I say, was saying before, you have multiple layers of the file system. So you could have uh, your main component being, say, Debian. And then on top of that, you could have your uh, another layer that that adds to that Apache and you know, MySQL or something like that. And then on top of that, you could have your just your uh, application. Uh, and when you build, if only the application is changed, it doesn't need to build the other components. It'll only, it'll, every layer is uh, checksummed and hashed. So it'll realize that the lower layers don't need to be rebuilt, and it'll only build the, high, the changed layers. So that means it's very quick to build one instance over the top of the other. And of course, you've got near instant start because it's uh, pretty much, there's no operating system to start. It starts pretty much instantly. From the development point of view, uh, you could also uh, do some things to optimize for Docker. Uh, so you can do the git auto build, uh, and you can put your Docker file in your git repo so as it's there for Docker to pull it in and build from. Uh, likewise, you could build your Docker, uh, build all your different components into smaller um, modular components. Like before, when I was saying you had you could add a layer that has Apache and MySQL. You could put them into separate containers, and then you could develop them both separately, but you can always link them together whenever you need the two of them to work together. And that way, you have it more modular. You can very easily just put this Docker on that machine and, or run it on the same machine. You can gives you more ability to move things around. Uh, and dynamic config. So when you start your Docker image, it pushes into your Docker image uh, variables into the Docker images environment that tell you about what your Docker image is running as. So if, if for example, I had an Apache Docker image and I had a MySQL Docker image and I started the Apache Docker image and told it to link to MySQL, it will have variables in there that link to what the IP address of the MySQL uh, instance is, uh, what port it is, etc. So by looking at those variables, I don't have to go through setting up the Apache to use that MySQL. I can set it up so as it uses those variables instead. Say, for instance, a startup script within the Apache container that would set those, use those variables to set up the config in Apache so as it's using that uh, that MySQL database. And like, it also does the same with host names now as well. So if, for example, I called this uh, uh, MySQL database, I called it you know, MySQL. And when I linked it in to uh, Apache, when I started Apache, linked it to MySQL, it would have in its host file a MySQL uh, host name that links to the proper IP address. And you also have um, external volumes, so as well as linking to another container, you can also link to a directory on your uh, host operating system. Uh, so this would be useful if you had c configuration that you wanted to be able to change. You could uh, start the Apache and link it to your uh, www directory where all your uh, HTML files are. And then Apache doesn't have your HTML files in there. It just links into the directory that you've got on your host machine and you're free to change whatever you want on that, those directories. And, and the Apache image, the Apache container will see those changes as if it was on its own drive. Uh, so it's usually, I think it would be better to have your configuration and data outside the container, uh, because that would mean that you could easily upgrade the container and not have to worry about 
you know, your config files changing and that sort of thing. If I've made changes to my config file and I've got it on an external volume, then when I stop the container, pull in the latest Apache container and start it up again, I don't have to worry about going through and setting all those configs up again. They're all just linked in because it's I've got the import con configs as a linked volume into the container. Uh, you could also do similar sort of things with the scripts. Like I said, if Apache had it, if the Apache container was started by a script, and that script would pull in the variables that that Docker sets for that container, it could then automatically set up Apache. That way, you know, otherwise you're going to have to set the settings every time you're pulling a new version. Oops. All right, so for de deployments, the key advantage here is cross-compatibility. You don't have to worry about uh, which Linux distro you're delivering to. So if I'm, we all know that you know a software is usually written for Red Hat or maybe Ubuntu these days, but if you're running some obscure distro, you're going to have a harder time finding the uh, software that you want, uh, especially if it's proprietary or something like that, they're not going to officially support you. And they're not going to have an install for your machine, for your uh, distro. But if they deliver that in a Docker image, then it doesn't matter because the Docker image is self-contained. So the, so like, the Docker images are completely self-contained. So they contain their own libraries of the correct version. The, the correct directory structure, the settings, the OS and components, configs, etc. So they're all um, in the container and you don't have to worry about... You, you can quite easily run a CentOS application on a Ubuntu box and as far as the application is concerned, it's running on a CentOS box. It sees the CentOS file system, it sees the, everything the same. Uh, the only limitation to that is that maybe if you have a particular kernel setting, because the one thing that containers all share is the kernel. So if you've got a kernel setting that your application particularly needs and your host machine particularly doesn't want that uh, kernel setting, then you're going to have problems. But you know, I don't think that's very common these days. So deployment and install. So to install Docker is pretty much just a Docker pull, you just put Docker pull CentOS and it'll get the uh, CentOS uh, image, it'll pull it down and then you just do Docker run and you're running CentOS. Uh, the pulls only pull down what's changed. So say for instance, say for instance I've already got CentOS 6.4 on my system and I do Docker pull CentOS latest and it pulls down CentOS 6.5 it's only going to pull, if the 6.5 is based on the same base image, it's only, go, only, it's only going to pull down the differences between those two images. So like you'd, you'd have your CentOS 6.4 layer and it pull down the layer that contains all the differences between CentOS 4 and CentOS 5, for example. Uh, obviously, if you go in between larger versions, it's probably easier to start again uh, from a a new base layer. Yep. So in that scenario, it's taking from a configuration file of your personal layer that you change. Uh, you, uh, a new version came down and you need to do it. What would happen? Would you pull the You'd have to build your layer again. Would it, would it be easier to put it still It's not going to. It, your layer is. Your, your Docker container has a hash, right? And every layer below it, it knows what the hashes are. So if you've got, say for instance, your, say for instance your container is based off uh, CentOS 6.4, right? That CentOS 6.4 image has a hash, and your container knows that this is my hash, my chain of hashes that gets gets me up to your container. So even if you update with uh, CentOS 6.5, that hash is still there, and your your container is still using that layer. The fact that you've got a more up-to-date layer is not going to change that. 
if you wanted to use the up, more up-to-date layer, you'd have to tell it, okay, I'm going to do another Docker build. I'm going to build a fresh uh, container for myself, and this time I'm going to base it off the, the newer CentOS. So it's the, the whole Docker container thing is meant to be a throwaway thing. It's not meant to be like a, a distro where you have, this is my distro, this is the one I'm going to use for now, and if I want to, for, for you know, the next couple of years, it's not like that. The idea of a container is that it is a throwaway thing. You want a new container, you can build one in a couple of minutes. It's not hard, and, and I'll show that later on. So, like I was saying before, the containers are multi-layered. Uh, so, so when you run the container, even when you run the container, so say for instance you have your your image that's based on CentOS 6.4. When you run it, it actually can take can creates a container, and that container has its own layer on top of that. If you run another instance of your image, it's going to have another container layer. And changes you do in one is going to be separate from the changes you do in the other. And if you then decide, okay, these changes that I've done, I want them to be in my image, you have to do Docker commit to take those changes and commit that to a new image. And it will be a new image because it'll be a new hash, so it'll have a, a new, it'll be a whole new contain, uh, image. You can then tag it as being, you know, my app latest. So as then next time you do run doc, uh, Docker run my app latest, it will use that container, that image, and start a, and spawn a container from that image. So yeah, so that's what I was saying here. Uh, running containers write their storage to a whole new layer. Uh, containers can be committed and pushed. So if I, like I said, you make your changes, you commit it, and then you just do uh, Docker push and push it up to your registry. And then from another machine, you can just do Docker pull, and then you'd have that, that same change. Uh, and images, and there's a complete version of it. You can actually see it, and if I do, uh, actually, I'll just show you that here. Yeah. Let me fire up a different one. Is that large enough to see? Yep. So if I do Docker images, you'll see that I have this Fedora one, for example. So if I do Docker history, uh, let me check what I've got here. Yep. So. I'll just pull this across a little bit. So I'm just doing a Docker history, and I'm telling it to show me the image Fedora that's been tagged 20. So that's going to be this Docker, uh, this Fedora 20 version that I have sitting here. And if you do that, you can see that it was originally created 12 months ago, and then on top of that, I've got this layer that's added a maintainer, and then someone else added some other uh, part of the build process added this file. And even the files that are being added are hashed and version controlled. So in my, if, my, if, my, if in my build directory I change one of those files, it will realize that that's a different file and it'll realize that it's not going to produce the same hash and so it'll build that layer again or build another version of that layer, I should say. Um, <coughs> contain, so in the name of there is some security benefits, but it's not the main goal of, of uh, Docker images. Uh, the fact that your container only runs the app process uh, and not the whole operating system gives you some a reduced target, if you like, a reduced uh, surface area for someone to attack, attack you. Uh, containers can be built with only what they need to run, so you don't need to put in all the libraries under the sun. You only need the libraries in that container to um, 
to run your app. Most of the containers out there are based on a whole operating system. I don't see this as being ta uh, taken full advantage of what a container could be. Uh, you can get containers that are based on uh, its other smaller arrangements. Uh, so they are isolated uh, from the rest of the operating system, but it is possible to break out of that. They haven't they haven't reached that endpoint where they're going to say it's secure to you know run an untrusted application. If you wanted to add more security to it, you could always uh, add SE Linux around it. So you could tag your container as being belonging to that SE Linux context, and that any process running within that container can only see that SE Linux context and therefore can't see any other files outside of that context. So examples of building Docker. Now, like I was saying, most containers out there are based on a whole operating system. So you'll find things like if I... Uh, Excuse me, one moment. So this is a Docker image that's for Mongo. And if I go down and find where's the build? There's supposed to be another tag here. Nope, it's not going to show me. There was another tag here that showed the Docker, the Docker file itself. And it's not going to show me. You know, like I was saying, most of the Docker images out there are based on uh, some other OS. So they have like a an OS level component. Uh, yeah, build these apps. So in this example, for, for example, <coughs> this is the Docker file that built this, uh, this Mongo image. And you can see that it starts from the base of Ubuntu. So I'll just make that bigger. <coughs> so it's going to pull down this Ubuntu image that's tagged 14.04. And it's going to use that as a starting point for which it does the the following commands to make the Mongo image for this person. Uh, so you can see that the first thing it's going to do is it's going to run apps get, uh, it's going to do some apt get and updates to pull in the Mongo components. Uh, and then it's going to expose port this port, and then it's going to add some files. 
and then it's going to set the start command as being that. So starting with the Ubuntu image, it takes that Ubuntu image and it runs all these commands in, t in sequence and each command that it runs will create another image layer, another file system layer with another hash and another. So if you get halfway through the build process and it stops, you actually got the container that it was that it was last running, that it successfully ran the last command in. So you could go into that container. You can do docker run start this container. You can go in and try to figure out why it didn't do that last step. So if something goes wrong, it makes it very easy to debug what went wrong. <clears throat> but all this basically implies, I, I don't particularly like this way of doing it because if, for example, I don't like this way for a couple of reasons. One, the size. These uh, Docker images are typically small for an iOS, but they're still like 200, 300 meg, which is not much for an OS, but you know, if you're trying to package up a small little application, it, say for instance you're packaging a 30 meg application, you've now got an image that's 230 meg. I don't, it's not clean in my opinion. Uh, it also means that you've got a lot of layers upon layers upon layers and depending on what uh, type of storage you're using in the back end of your Docker containers, which when Docker first came out it used AUFS which wasn't in every kernel, which is why when Docker came out it was only available in Ubuntu and not Red Hat and other things like that because it needed a kernel that supported AUFS. They've since taken that out and they've made it uh, a driver base. So you now have a storage driver and depending on what type of file system you have, you're either using AUFS as a back end for all these layers or you're using device mapper, which is uh, I don't really know exactly what device mapper does, but it's another way of storing layers and change la uh, layers upon layers. Or you can use ButterFS, and they're probably going to add more in the future. But AUFS has a limit on how many layers you can have. So if you're going to have layers upon layers upon layers, you could get to a point where you've got more layers than what AUFS could handle, and you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, I think the other reason I don't like it is it introduces an unknown, uh, unknown element into your release version. If you're doing this for a software release and you're doing, uh, you know, this is version one of my software, it's running on this image, but the next time you build, even if you're building version one, if your build process is apt get, you know, my necessary components, you're now no longer sure what necessary components versions you're downloading. You're downloading whatever Ubuntu thinks is the most up-to-date. So if you're trying to release something that's of a known version, I don't think this is a good way to go. Yes, yes you can. Yeah. Yes, and then you could go and release that to the to the your customer or to your cloud or whatever, and you know that for that container it's right, but you'd it, it's still something that's outside of your control a little bit. Uh, so yes, you're mostly protected, but if you're releasing particular, if version control is important to you, you're not fully in control of that version control. If if for example you found that I did a, a Docker build. And this particular version of MariaDB or you know MySQL or whatever you pulled in that got pulled in by this apt get didn't work with your application. You can't undo. You can't go back to the previous version of you know. Sorry. I suppose you could, and then you'd have to go in and figure out what the problem is. Go back and you know pin it and you know etc. If you pinned it, yes, you would have more control over the version and you'd be back to a point where you've got control over the version, but you don't see that being done in any of the Docker images. They're always just doing apt-get, get me the latest. <clears throat> 
and not just get me the latest of the app that I'm in, that I'm installing as part of my base, but also app get update the whole Ubuntu operating system file system layer as well. So, you know. So, I've seen a couple of people do it in a what I think is a better way of doing it. Uh, I've seen one person do it. Uh, there's a program called Build Root. It's mainly used for building embedded Linux uh, operating systems. So, uh, so I've seen someone who used build roots to basically build a Docker image, and that Docker image is the one that I'm using as my base, uh, and it's just basically BusyBox and nothing else. So that whole Docker image is two and a half meg, and I'm using that as my base for going forward. Is that not, you know? <coughs> And yes, he could potentially change that underneath me. Like he could go and update that, and then if I did a Docker build, I would be pulling in his latest release. But then I could also tag that, or I could. Uh, what I did is I actually did a Docker pull of BusyBox, and then I did a Docker push, my my username slash BusyBox up to the cloud. So I've got my own copy of his BusyBox that I know is a particular version. Um, and I think this is the way people will do it in the future, I hope. Uh, so say, for instance, the people who make uh, MariaDB or MySQL or something like that, they know what components are necessary for MySQL, and they've got to build something to test anyway. So if they're building a uh, Docker image that contains just the things that are important for their uh, application to run, and then they test that, and then they release that, I think you'll get a, a much smaller uh, database image or application image than pulling the whole Ubuntu operating system. And, and while it's only 200 meg, and so say for instance, I had three apps that are all based on Ubuntu 14.04. So the Ubuntu 14.04 base image would be shared because it's you know a layered system, it's it's a known version, it matches the hash, so it all be shared and it wouldn't actually take up that much room. But if one of my apps is using Ubuntu 14.04, another one's using CentOS, another one's using Debian, or another one's using Ubuntu 12, then then that base layer, then I've got multiple copies of those base layers, and if I'm running hundreds of them, yeah. Um, what I was doing for my application, and I haven't got it to the point where it's running yet, so this is what I'm hoping to do. Uh, and I, I've got running for some of them anyway. Uh, I basically started off with BusyBox, and I'll just show you here on mine. So in this container here, uh, get this over. In this container here, I've got uh, so that's my BusyBox image that was built from uh, BuildRoot, and this one over here. is my image that's built from Fedora. So into this, I have linked this directory new root. Uh, so I've linked this directory new root. And that's actually a file, uh, a directory on my, on my host operating system. So into Fedora, I installed MariaDB. And then on my BusyBox, I've got the same uh, new root linked. And basically, with MariaDB installed here, I just did yum install MariaDB, I have a starting point for pulling all the components I need into my, uh, into my BusyBox image. Yep. <coughs> 
Core OS is more for running Docker images on top of. You can, yes. But it's still 20 meg or something like that, uh, it's, which is not much, I know. It's, but Yes, yes, you, you could use Docs. The, the boot to Docker image is also very small. It's only like 20 meg or something like that. Uh, mainly, again, used for running Docker images on top of, but it's also very small to use as a starting point too. But I don't know. BusyBox was there. It works. Yeah. Whereas having, having a node, having it be a couple of meg sets in the sense of a web address, but it also be repeatable. Yes. Yes. But again, you could, if I wanted to track the BusyBox, like I, the guy who made the BusyBox article, he's, he's actually got a blog post where he details how he built it using build root. Uh, so you could do it yourself, make a build root BusyBox yourself. Or you could just do, do a, a Docker pull busy box. This is the one I'm going to use, so I'm going to make a copy of it, and I'm just going to do a Docker push to my registry. This is now my busy box base that I'm basing it off. So I could still track a known version that way too. So what I basically the f I started actually by doing this. Uh, if I go back to there. So what I started by doing is I started by doing a repo query and having a look at what uh, the dependencies for MySQL were. And then I did a yum downloader to pull in all the dependent RPMs and then basically just uh, use that to do RPM to a new root directory and started using that as a a basis for uh, for what I was going to package my MariaDB into, but the dependency list is quite long because it includes things such as Bash and the init of the, the startup scripts, the init file system, Grub. It, the dependency goes all the way back down to Grub, so you end up pulling a lot of things that I don't actually need because my BusyBox image already has a shell. It already has you know, most of these other tools. So now I've just basically installed it into my CentOS Docker image and I just copied the executable across, did an LDD on that executable and it told me I need this library, this library, this library. And then I just went and grabbed those libraries from the CentOS box, sorry, from the Fedora box that I installed it on, so I know that those libraries are suitable for that uh, Maria DB executable, and I just basically pull them across that way. And I've got to a point that it starts, but now it's complaining about uh, some uh, shared config file or something like that that it needs. So I, I pulled in the shared user share MySQL, which has a whole lot of uh, uh, language files and things like that. So I'm getting close to getting it to run, but not quite yet. Yes, but that list is also going. Yes, actually, you're right. You could do that. Um, you can actually do a Docker diff, and it'll show you the difference between the container and the image that it's based on, and it just has a nice, simple list. But there's other things that are installed you know, that you know, I don't necessarily need. But yeah, I should have, that would have been a good way to go too. Sorry? No, it wouldn't. No, you're right. So I'd still have to end up pulling in some libraries anyway. Uh, it's, 
So there are other ways to build a raw, more compact base. Uh, you can uh, manually build it by basically just starting a container image, you know, Docker run BusyBox, make my changes, do, compile my file, program, whatever, and then when you're happy with it, just uh, go out and do a Docker commit. When you exit the container, it doesn't destroy the container layer. The container layer is still there. So if you go into here, that's actually inside my container. If I do Docker PS, that shows me my two layers that I'm running, the Fedora and the uh, MariaDB that I'm in the middle of building. Uh, but if I do Docker PS minus A, that shows me all the containers. And you'll see here, there's containers here that I used a while ago. I exited, but it doesn't destroy a container by default. You, there's a flag you can put in the Docker run to say when I exit, automatically destroy the container. But by default, it doesn't. When you exit, the Docker container stays around. You can actually go, you can actually do a Docker start and a Docker attach to go back into that container in a running state. Or you can just do a Docker commit and commit it to a to an image and make that a per more permanent type thing. Uh, and yeah. So you can manually build your, uh, your container on top of your image, and then when you're ready, you can commit it. And when you're happy with it, you can do a, a Docker push to push it into your uh, registry. Uh, there are other people who are using Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant has been updated to, I haven't used Vagrant myself, but apparently Vagrant's been updated to uh, understand Docker containers. So it can actually, you can write a Vagrant script to build a container. You can import it from a tarball. So if you've got a tarball of your operating system file system or your application file system, you can just do a Docker import and import the that uh, tarball into the container uh, complete. And that'll be the, the only thing in your file system because it'll be the only layer there. Uh, likewise, you can export a uh, export or import a uh, raw file system. Uh, there is a difference between export and, and save. So when you export, it drops all the layers. So if you've got your contains, your your base operating system, your modified changes, your other modified changes, your container image, and then it's basically, I don't think it would work from a container image. I think a Docker export would only work from a, from an image. So you've got your your base operating system, you've got your modified changes, your modified changes, and that's your image there. You can do a Docker export, and it'll take that file system as it stands and put it to a tarball, but it'll lose all the layers. So you'll just have a tarball of what that file system looks like. You can then do a Docker import and you'd have a container that only consists of one layer, which would be suitable for having your base for other containers, but you'd lost that layering uh, version information. Whereas load and save actually saves that information. It also exports to a tarball, but it has in it the layer components. And when you load it back in, you actually have those layer components back in. And I think that's it. Yeah, so any questions? Um, so uh, I'm guessing that if you want to do this with the big platforms, like you want to do it with the Raspberry Pi, you can program it into the Fedora and the ARM platform to make that possible. It is CPU and kernel specific. So that's the only real limitation to the Docker. Uh, that would mean that I have heard of some people who have compiled or optimized their OS for an Atom processor, for example, and at that particular Atom processor used one particular uh, CPU feature that isn't available in other CPUs. So if you compiled it like that, uh, and you use that compiled version in your Docker image, it wouldn't be transportable to other x86 machines. But let's face it, most people don't use uh, CPU optimizations too much these days because I mean, it's uh, 
C CPUs are fast enough that people, gen most distros pretty much just make it general enough, the executable general enough that it'll run on any x86. Uh, I think it also has a limitation that it's 64-bit, I think. But, you know, pretty much everybody's 64-bit these days. Uh, any other questions? There is a limitation on the kernel version. Uh, it's about 3.8. I'm not sure exactly what version. Yeah. I tried to uh, put it in 12 OS, and this upgrade is to 3.8. Yeah. Yeah, which which is also a reason why it uh, sure. didn't work too well for Red Hat version six, because you know, first of all, Red Hat version six doesn't have AUFS, and second of all, it's running on one of the older kernels. Uh, it does run on Red Hat six, uh, but they're always making newer additions to the you know namespaces and uh, uh, Linux containers and things like that. So yeah. I'm pretty sure Red Hat 7 was actually waiting for Docker release. The fact that it released on the same week is just too much of a coincidence. They have mentioned that they that they want to you know improve the container the you know, containerization, if you like, the, the limitation, the isolation, I should say. Uh, but they haven't really said when. Uh, I would say SE Linux is also a good way of isolating it anyway. A and I think some of the uh, OSs that are dedicated to running Docker containers have built into it that it sets up an SE Linux uh, context for each container and therefore isolates those processes to that context. So effectively, you've got a little bit of isolation with the Docker uh, Linux container type thing, but you've got another layer of isolation with this SE Linux basically barring it from reading any other file in the file system. Potentially, yes. Let's put it this way. There have been exploits within virtualization where the, the attacker runs a virtual machine on the same physical box as your virtual machine, and through various methods, they can figure out things about your virtual machine. And there have been people who, God knows how, have managed to get SSH keys and SSL certificates from another virtual machine just by the proximity they are to that virtual machine. So even at a virtual machine layer, there are hacks to break into that sort of thing. Yeah? So if you have a base uh, operating system and you SSH to your uh, Docker instance, you, uh, you don't have to SSH. You can do a Docker attach. When, when you, so if I, um, let me change back down the root directory so as this list is longer. If I do, a Docker uh, images, you'll see that, uh, uh, let's say, for instance, this CentOS one. If I do Docker run, if I just do Docker run, uh, it will just run the command, and I won't have a prompt into it. But if you do Docker run IT, you're running interactive, and you're attaching your terminal to that Docker container. So if I do Docker run CentOS, and bash, so I'm running bash, and I'm running bash on the CentOS, and I can specify that I'm running this uh, version that's been tagged 6.4, or I can just say that, and it'll assume that I'm running the latest, whatever version of CentOS is tagged as being latest. And if I do that, that bash prompt is now at... Uh, where's release? Ah, oh, right. This is Red Hat 6, isn't it? So it's Red Hat release. So that bash prompt is now 
at CentOS 6.5, and it's in that container. I can then exit, and if I do a, a Docker PS minus A, you'll see that that CentOS one that I was running, that's its container. I, I can then do uh, Docker starts. And I can do it by name or I can do it by container ID. Uh, when I do it by name, I have to do it by the container name. This is the image name. But there's a container name off to the side too. It picks some name at random by default unless you actually tell it to tag it and I want this container to be called my database or whatever. Uh, so that I can just do docker start and then I can do docker attach. And now I'm right back. So the Docker start starts it back up again, uh, running the same program that it originally started with. Uh, and then I just do a Docker attach, and I plug plug in my terminal back into the into that container. But I think containers would be most useful when not running with a terminal attached, running it in daemon mode, if you like. Uh, you can. You could have, uh, say for instance, you had a uh, MySQL database container. I could spawn off three copies of that, and they'll all be running MySQL with the same settings. Uh, but when you run a container, you can do this. If I do Docker run, uh, let's do it as IT. Right, so that would be doing the same thing, but I could also go in here and say port uh, eighty. All right, so what that'll do, it will connect port eighty eighty inside the container to port eighty on my physical host. So although all the SQL instances, each container is running its the uh, MySQL server with the normal MySQL port and the same MySQL port, I would use this to basically tell it, on this one, I'm exporting that MySQL port to port 3366, and on this one, I'm report exporting it to port 3367. And that way, I could run them concurrently without any sort of hassle. You can also link them together. So if I say, uh, this is my MariaDB, my MySQL uh, container, and I start up another uh, application, and I say, uh, basically I do like link, and I put, uh, so say for instance I started uh, Docker run MySQL, uh, and I gave it minus T for tag, MySQL instance. And then I came down here and said, and I came down here and I said, okay, I'm running this now, I'm running CentOS, but I'm linking it to MySQL instance. Then anything that's been defined in the MySQL instance as being uh, an exposed port or a volume or whatever is then available inside that CentOS box. So if I started MariaDB, it, when, if when I built that MariaDB, I told it that it has exposed port 3306, then this link would have CentOS C in that port. And likewise with volumes and that sort of thing. You can also add add these to the at the uh, at time of running too. So if you built the Marit, uh, the MySQL uh, container and you told it to export port 3306, but when you ran it, you also told it you also told it to a, Expose ports uh, 8080, then that instance of the container would have both of those expo exposed. Any other questions? How big that group can be in? Sorry? How big size? So I'm going to have to make this a little smaller. Uh, let me go to the other. <laughs> 
Now you can see here, this is the virtual size. So this one's quite large. Uh, and that's the MariaDB one. But that's the complete size. So that's including the other layers. All right, so if you had a layer that was common, say for instance the operating system layer, it would be counted here. But the other the other images that are using that layer that had that layer in common would also be using that same things, that same space. Yes. So say for instance this uh, container consisted of uh, CentOS and then on top of that uh, MySQL. Right? And I built another image that consisted of CentOS and Apache. The CentOS part is common. So although it only takes up one copy of that CentOS part on my physical hardware, on my physical machine, the virtual size will still show both of them as using that full, uh, that space as part of that image. Yes, yes, it, it does include the common ones in its count. So it is more efficient than that. I, I have also run into problems with the, on one machine, I ran out of hard disk space because I had so many different images that I pulled down I hadn't been cleaning up after myself and starting containers and copying files in and out and all that sort of thing. And it was using the device mapper storage method uh, and when I realized my hard disk was full, even after I cleaned it up, I couldn't get this device. I couldn't get them back. <laughs> so uh, I, I still got the files there, but I can't figure out whenever I put those files back in so Docker sees them as its, uh, as its uh, repository of, com of local data, it has a fit and refuses to start the Docker the Docker um, uh, service. Uh, yeah, probably would be, yes. Sorry? It won't matter because if you're, the, when you run a container, uh, when it, so you've got the image, which is what your, the more permanent side of Docker, right? Is the one that you push through the repositories, is the one that you pull down from the repositories, etc. But when you run that image, it adds another layer on top of that, the container layer. Right? So all changes, all writes go to that container layer. So that that image is the is the base. And that image consists of you know layers as well. But this is another layer on top of that. So you got your it's, it's using the image is a starting point, and you have your container image there. If you run it, if you run the same image again, it will start up another container over here. So you'll have two containers. They'll have their own container layer, but those, and that's what they'll be writing to. But all the common information will be that image. So I say again. Yes, yes. So if, if, for example, and I have done this in one of my builds. I, in one of my builds, one of my steps was to do a chmod. Um, sorry, chmod? Or ch no, change ownership. So in one of my builds, I put the files into the thing, and then my next step in my Docker build was to do uh, change ownership of all the files that I just put in. And because that was a change in the file, it actually doubled the size of the image. Because I had the container, I had the layer that I copied the files in, and then the layer that I did the church to own basically saw all that as all that all those files as being different and duplicated the whole thing into another layer. Sorry? Sorry? 
Yeah. I suppose so, but it would only be on that container layer. Because everything's the image doesn't change. When, when you start a container, the image is assumed to be static. It, everything that you write is into this container layer. If you then want to commit that container layer to a new image, you'd have to, from outside the container, do a Docker commit. And it would create another image that is laid, that uses this as a base and adds that additional information. And then you'd have this image that has the whole original image plus this new layer on top of it. And if you spawned off another machine on that, there's a Docker run, it would then add another container layer. If you're using AUFS, which was what Docker originally used, there's a limit of 42 layers. I don't think... In a stack, yes. In one stack. Yeah, if you've got like... If they're off on different images entirely, it doesn't matter. Pretty much every change you do is is a layer. So if you're doing your Docker build and your Docker build is doing anything, even changing the... Uh, the there's a flag in the Docker build file that basically says who was the author of this Docker file. Even that commits a layer. So... Sorry? Yeah, you can see that... Yeah. If I do uh, here... And I think it's I, I think it's sorry, I, I think it's also a good idea to keep your your data separate anyway, because if you're the do, the idea of a docker image is that it's a throwaway component. You update it, change it, modify it, build it on the fly, deploy it on the fly, that sort of thing. And if you're doing your config and that sort of thing inside the container, if it's not part of the build process, then that becomes a lot more difficult to do a do the uh, deployment and and spawning off the uh, different instances of it and all that sort of thing. That becomes a lot more tedious because you have to do configuration stuff. So your configuration and data should be external to the container. That way you can update your container on the fly, throw it away. It doesn't matter. There's nothing important in it. You, you could run Puppet and Chef inside a Docker container, but I don't see... Sorry? You can, anything you can do on a physical machine, you can pretty much do on a container. Yes, yeah, you could do it that way. Uh, most people seem to be doing it the other way around. That is, they're doing the Puppet uh, they're using Puppet or Chef to create, to be, to set up the build process, and then the build process builds the container. And that way, the container doesn't need to have Puppet or anything like that in there. So much, you could do it the way you're talking about, having the the container, and then inside the container running Puppet and doing updates, etc. But most people seem to be doing it the other way around, that they're using Puppet or Chef or some other orchestration thing to set up the build process, and then the build process is building the container in a, a much more simple con container that doesn't have the need for Puppet or anything like that. If you want to update it, you can always just build another one. It doesn't take long to build another one. Sorry? Well, it's, you could run, you could use Puppet on that, on the physical OS layer, to sort of like say, okay, I'm going to spawn off this, I'm going to do a Docker pull this container, I'm going to spawn off a dozen uh, instances of that container, and that sort of thing, but you don't have to have the puppet inside each container. That seems superfluous. 
that, that's what core OS is edging towards. That, that's what that core OS is edging towards. They actually have, uh, and Red Hat is actually talking about doing something similar as well in their in their uh, future deployments of Docker. That is, they have a layer on top of Docker that does the management of the orchestration and, and uh, spawning off so many instances on each of the servers, et cetera, uh, and distributing config acro across the cluster. But each uh, application or each instance of the components that you're talking about are much more simple and basic. Most containers should only run just the app. So it's it seems that uh, if you're, say, for instance, running uh, a database server in, in this container, it's just got the database server. It doesn't have it doesn't need to have uh, orchestration, you know, puppet uh, config pools and that sort of thing. Do that outside the container because then you only have to do it once. And then it's then that once it's got the con the configuration and it knows it has to spawn off a dozen of them. If you're doing the, the process monitoring even from outside on the physical host and you spawn off a, a dozen uh, SQL servers uh, and then you sort of say you notice that one of them dies, you can still see that from the outside from the because from the physical host it just looks like another process. It's only from in, within the container that it looks like this is my whole machine. And inside the container, if, if I go into one of these containers, so if I go into here, for example, if I do a PS, that container is only running Bash. It's not running anything else. It won't make any difference. Uh, let me try this. I'm not sure if this is going to go. Uh, I don't think you can run. Let me do this. Uh, what's the new command to show uh, IP stuff? It's try to be address, isn't it? Yeah. So that's the container IP address. And you can see that from outside too if you. Uh, I think it's some. Um, yeah. uh, let me do uh, Docker PS minus A. So I see my Fedora one there. If I do Docker info. Uh, no, I got this way. No, wrong one. There it is. Inspect. It is inspect. So this is a, a dump of all the information about that container. <coughs> and you can see in here things such as uh, the host name, uh, what ports are exposed, what images, what layer, the layering of the images, etc. Sorry? Yeah. And I did see IP address. Yeah, this one. So that's the Docker bridge that's basically bridging the containers together, of course. You can define limitations. Uh, like memory and things like that within a container. Uh, <coughs> pretty much, uh, Linux containers allows you to control a lot of things, such as number of CPUs. Basically, anything that a Linux container, it is just a Linux container. C groups, namespace, they, all those sorts of things that you can manipulate as part of Linux container is still available in Docker. I don't know how much of it is available at command line in Docker or how much of it you need to go in and you know start getting down to your Linux container type commands. 
Docker is just a, a wrapper around standard Linux containers. And the reason why it's such a big thing is because Linux containers are, can get quite tedious to set up. There's a lot of bits and pieces. Uh, different people do it different ways. Uh, so the main thing that Docker adds to the thing is standardization and the ability to push and pull to a cloud and the layering. That's the only thing that Docker really adds. It, the actual containerization is technology that's been in Linux for a while. It's just been tedious to do before. Is that it? Okay. Thank you.